Hello, Revive Youth Ministry. Have you ever known someone that just kind of runs on their own time? They're usually always late for whatever the event is. Well, in my family, that would definitely be my brother. My brother seems like he doesn't have a sense of time, and his sense of responsibility for a long time was like offsetting. Now, it's a little bit better now that he's on his own and doing his own thing. It's still kind of wishy-washy, but um, I remember this time that uh, I was needing to take him to work. And so with it, uh, the drive was about 40 minutes to an hour long. And so with it being that time frame, you know that you need to at least leave an hour ahead of time, and then you need to kind of do maybe even an hour and 15 to 20 minutes ahead of time so that way you can get to work at there just before or way before so that way you can punch in on time and not have any issues. Because usually you're not getting to your job at the time that you're supposed to work because then by the time you walk back, punch in, you're actually going to be late. And so uh, my brother didn't get this concept because for the longest time, he felt like he was entitled to certain things. And so um, this particular incident, uh, it was time for him to get up uh, to get ready for work. And so about 30 minutes prior to him needing to go to work, um, I go in and say, hey, your alarm went off. You didn't get up. Um, you probably need to get up so you can get ready for work. And so... Um, he said, no, I got time. I, I'm going to lay here for another five minutes. And it was like, okay, well, 10 minutes goes by about 20 minutes prior to needing to leave. Uh, Hey, it's been five minutes. Are you getting up to go to work? So that way you're not having any issues. Uh, uh, give me one moment. I'm getting up now. And then another 10 minutes go by. And so then 10 minutes prior to us needing to leave, at this point in time, it's like, okay, you get dressed, uh, maybe flick back your hair. It's a factory, so it's not like something that you have to dress up super nice for. And so um, it's about 10 minutes prior, like, okay, you don't have time to really do much. Just get ready. But he decides, oh, well, I need to take a shower before I go to work. And so he goes and hops in the shower. And so he's in the shower. He takes about five, six minutes for that. So now... In order for him to leave on time, he would have to get out and be ready in four minutes. But no, that's not the case. He then gets out of the shower. He goes, he uh, puts his clothes on, he brushes his teeth, slicks back his hair like he's going on a date, puts cologne on, he's doing all these different things. And so now we're about 10 minutes after the time that we needed to leave. So then I go and I get in the truck, I'm waiting for him and have the engine on and stuff and he's still not coming out. And so um, you go back, run back in and like, what are you doing? He's, I'm still getting my boots on. I'm still like doing all these different things. And so like, we're just constantly running later and later. And so uh, with a 40 to an hour drive to get to his job, we are now eating 30 minutes later than we are supposed to be leaving. And so we get into the vehicle and now he's on like high alert because when he drives, uh, he thinks that he's a NASCAR driver. And so he expects everybody else to drive like that. And so he gets in, he's like, we got to go. We got to go get moving, get moving. I'm going to be late. Well, you're going to be late either way because you waited so long to get around. But so we get going, um, we come to this uh, stop where it's a one way stop and then there's oncoming traffic that kind of goes both ways. Now, this was the winter time and um, he's rushing, he's yelling in my one ear. This uh, car is like coming. There's a decent amount of distance for it, so it could be cleared, but um and they turn on their blinker, they slow down, and so I decided to go ahead and go. And so I started to pull out, and the ladies sped back up a little bit, and then hit her brakes, and then honked the horn. And because she honked her horn, it caused, like, that kind of brief second of, like, delay of processing to, like, hit the gas even more. And by the time that, like, things started to process, uh, she had slid and hit the back of my truck. Now, 
it wasn't like a super high speed situation and she was able to apply some of the brakes and I was able to move some. So it didn't cause a lot of damage to either vehicle. Um, we didn't have to go to a body shop or anything like that to get it repaired, but the whole aspect of it then caused more time, more delay. And he had to run back home, go get the car that was barely working so he could try to drive, um, and probably cause more damage to the car. Um, driving it there which is why i was taking them to work we have these situations where it's like you don't rush me we are on my schedule i'm doing you a favor i'm doing certain things and so there's this concept of um needing to slow down to move at someone else's pace or plan for someone else's pace in a sense now, the person that wrote this series, Slow Your Roll, he talks about a story of how he rushed his dad. And so with him rushing his dad, um, he needed to go to church or they were getting ready to go to church and he wanted to get there ahead of time or on time or whatever the reason was. And so he goes and uh, he gets ready, he hops in the vehicle, but his dad was one of those people that kind of puts around a little bit more. And he's in the car, he's waiting, he's waiting, he's wondering what's going on. So now he's honking the horn, not caring what the neighbors might think or anything like that. And as he's honking his horn, uh, his dad finally comes out uh, he said, what take, what took you so long? He said, well, I put a load of laundry in and he's like, why would you do that? Didn't you hear me honking your horn saying we need to leave? And he says, well, that's the reason why I, uh, put a load of laundry in. I'm the dad. You don't rush me. We move at my pace, my time. And then the rest of the ride, he's just kind of like thinking to himself, like, why would he do something like that? Not that he took it as like a, a, token of wisdom but he was like actually he's even more appalled at that point and um it wasn't until later that he realized that you know the concept of it is so true so we're continuing our uh so your role series tonight we're continuing to study the slow pace we are sometimes called to live as believers at the beginning of the series, I talked about the Sabbath and how uh, when we look at the Sabbath, it is a time to not just sit back and rest and do nothing, but it's actually a time to step away from the busyness of our life and focus on God. Remember what he has done. It's a time of worship, a time to um, re-evaluate our lives and what our presence with him is. And then last week we talked about how sometimes we need to slow down and wait for God because sometimes his plan is uh, for us later than what we think it's supposed to be. And so we don't want to rush because uh, he may have great things, but the time that we're supposed to receive that great thing is supposed to be later down the road, not like an instant gratification. So we get into tonight's lesson where we're talking about uh, how God is not always going to be moving at our pace. Sometimes his pace seems incredibly quick for us, like uh, when he tells us to do something right now that we're afraid to do or tells us to stop something that we like doing. Uh, it could be to tell a kid about the gospel um, but you're not ready or to stop dating a kid, but you feel like you're in love with them that or her and that they're the greatest. Um, you quit a job, um, but I love the, having the paycheck, which is one of the things I mentioned before is working on the general concern about uh, the paycheck, the timing, the pace of it. Sometimes it's just we have to move slower or we need to speed up and um, you get the idea. I believe, however, that uh, where we run into the most frustration, uh, fear, and even lack of faith is when God's pace is slower than what we desire. When we want answers right now, directions right now, healing right now, everything right now, and he doesn't act immediately. When we don't see movement right away, we can easily start to question God. Well, is God really real because I prayed for this yesterday and we are now at eight o'clock in the morning and my prayers have not been answered, which is kind of silly. Or I prayed for this and now a month has gone by, a year has gone by. 
so much time has gone by, it then becomes a frustration because it's like, well, is he really there? Is he really listening? We question, does he really love me? Is he capable of doing this? Now, it's God. He's capable of doing all these things. He is real. Uh, he does love us. But the truth is that God is sometimes a slow-moving God, at least based on perception. His lack of haste does not necessarily indicate a problem on our end, and it doesn't mean he's not actually working behind the scenes on his end. God never promised speedy returns. In fact, he revealed himself to be slower moving than people might expect over time, both in prophecy and in Jesus. So I want to look at the Father's character through the life of Jesus. So if you go ahead and uh, turn to John 1.18, I'll give you a second, or you can just pause the video to turn to it. Okay, so it says, in John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. So no one has seen God the Father, but his character is revealed to us through the earthly life of Jesus, who is God himself. So I want to look at how Jesus arrived, lived, and died with purpose right on time. It wasn't always the timing that people wanted, but it was always the right time. People's faith was not in vain just because he did not show up when and how they wanted. First, let's look at his birth. Does anyone know when Jesus' birth was first prophesied? Maybe. Well, it first happened in the Garden of Eden, right after Adam and Eve had sinned. Genesis 3.15 promises the seed of the woman would one day crush the head of the serpent, which was the devil. This was the thousands of years before Jesus was born. The promise of a Messiah who would save his people was reiterated all the all like all through the Old Testament. So the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, and we can see how many books of the Bible there were. It was a long process. All through it, it was a promise that he was to come. So for a millennia, people look forward in faith and with hope that the Messiah would come. Hebrews 11 outlines countless people who lived and died who were tortured and put to death, hoping for a Messiah to come and rescue them. But he didn't come at those times. At the end of the Old Testament, a prophecy was given in Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Do you know what came after that? Silence. God did not speak to his people for 430 years. Did he cease to exist? Of course not. Was there a problem? Nope. Was he running late? Absolutely not. In Galatians 4, 4, it says, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. The time for Jesus' birth was predetermined by God. He knew exactly when Jesus was supposed to arrive, and he came at just that time. God may not operate on our schedules, but he does have a schedule and a purpose. He will move at his own pace and as he sees fit, often for reasons that are not immediately obvious to us. When I think about Jesus moving at his own pace, one story from his life on earth really stands out to me. It's found in Luke 8. So if you turn to Luke 8, 40 through 42... It says, on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. So Jairus came to Jesus with a serious problem. His young daughter was dying. How do you think he felt? Patient or in a hurry? Well, of course, he was probably in a hurry because his 
daughter was dying and he was like, well, I know you can heal her. Come now before something happens. He knew Jesus was their only hope and he needed his help right away. But Jesus wasn't in a big hurry. So we continue on in Luke 8, 43 through 48. And it says, A woman in the crowd has suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. See, Jesus set out on his way to help the man's daughter. And what happened, a woman got his attention by reaching out and touching the hem of his garment. So Jesus, knowing that he was on a on his way to go heal someone that was uh, dying, he stops and he addresses her. But immediately his disciples tried to shoo him along. Peter knew Jesus is on a serious mission. So when Jesus asked who touched him, he attempted to dismiss it. Who cares? You're in a big crowd. You're bumping up a bunch of against a bunch of people. Why are you in a hurry? Why or why aren't you? Why are you worried about it? Let's keep moving. But Jesus stopped and intervened in this woman's life. He spent time talking about faith and healed her. So how much how much uh, anger do you think Jairus may have felt or ang- anxiousness because his daughter's dying? They know that they're in a hurry, and Jesus, the person that's supposed to be uh, coming to heal or uh, take action, is now like putzing around, similar to. Uh, Jeff Selfs, the guy that wrote this uh, series, just like his father, or um, or like I guess even like me when I'm driving, where it seems like I'm putzing now that he's in a hurry. My brother's in a hurry. Didn't he explain the situation to Jesus that uh, his daughter was dying? Didn't he explain? It well enough that Jesus would understand. So why wasn't Jesus rushing to her bedside to heal her? We don't know how long this scene lasted, but I can assure you that as a parent, it must have felt like an eternity. When your child's health is in crisis, every moment drags on while you wait for it to be resolved. So you have this dad waiting on Jesus and in a hurry, hoping Jesus will get there on time. So Luke 8:49 it says while he was still speaking to her a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus the leader of the synagogue he told him your daughter is dead there's no use troubling the teacher now so think for a moment how uh, angry he must have felt how resentful hopeless because now his daughter is dead and they're telling him well don't bother the teacher now because she's already dead He might have felt guilty for not trying to get Jesus sooner. I'm sure he felt a lot of things, probably none of which was, this is okay. No problems here. What would you have felt if you were in this situation? I'm fairly certain I would have been mad at Jesus because uh, I would see that Jesus was taking so long. He saw what Jesus had done. He had heard all about him. He wouldn't have doubted Jesus' ability to heal people, but maybe he felt like he didn't matter to him. And his little girl didn't matter to him. Maybe he felt like God didn't love him personally. Maybe he would have been so disappointed that he just didn't care to follow anymore. I know those feelings are normal in times of crisis, but times of silence, when we can't see God move, But we must remember that God's ability to move in our lives isn't confined to the timeline we set for him. I'm sure the dad felt hopeless at this point. But Jesus comforts him in verse 50. 
It says Luke 8, 50 through 56. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith and she will be healed. When they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in the house except Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing. But he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told uh, them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. Jesus was still able to move to intervene in their lives. What did Jairus want? He wanted Jesus to heal his daughter from her sickness. Jesus chose not to do that. Uh, he chose to wait until she was actually dead. But that didn't mean that he wasn't intervening. He chose rather to raise her from the dead. Sometimes what we want from God is not what he wants for us. Sometimes when we want God to move is not the time he has planned to move. We do not set his pace. He doesn't answer to us. He must have faith or we must have faith and know that he is God and wait patiently for him to act. As Psalms 37, 7 says, But be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. There will be times when you do not see what God is doing. He is there, though, and he is working behind the scenes of your life. He wants what is best for you and is doing his part for that. There may be times of silence. There may be times when you are in a hurry for him to move, and he's not going to move at the expected pace that you want him to. There will be times when you're wondering what's going on and maybe you can't feel him. I want to close with an encouragement and a challenge that you will hopefully comfort and guide you. First, God is there. He loves you. He is working in his time and in his way. Second, as Jill Brisk says, when you can't feel him with your feelings, feel him with your faith. Slow your roll. I hope this series has uh, prompted you to slow down. And uh, with us being in the COVID-19 um, pandemic and we're in a hurry for it to end and for us to get back to our normal lives, I hope that this series has uh, allowed you to take time of Sabbath, not to run ahead of God and to also just to be patient with him. Let him work in his own time because when we rush him or if, we, if he were to fulfill it in the time that we want it, it would diminish. But when we wait for him, then it's a much more impactful, much more uh, gracious act. Healing the daughter would have been something pretty quick and simple, but raising her from the dead acted as a testament to how much power he has. There was way much more feelings and meaning that came from that portion by him waiting and fulfilling it at his own time. So go throughout this week, slow your roll, and we'll see you next week in our new series, Storm, which is a one-week series. So it's not really a series. Talk to you later. Bye.